Dr. Rajika Kurawita takes us from the microscopic to the uh, macrocosmic. Hi, Rajika. Welcome. Uh, now, you were at Mount Stromlo, uh, and now you're working on a similar project in Copenhagen. Can you tell us, how is Copenhagen different from Canberra? Uh, it's very cloudy, um, and overcast some days, but very bike-friendly. Canberra's bike-friendly as well, but um, Copenhagen's very bike-friendly. You can cycle everywhere. Everyone's very healthy, nice. <laughs> I, I believe that you think Canberra is a little bit more, shall I say, eccentric. Oh, um, yeah. When I did move here, um, that was something I missed. I missed the characters in Stromlo. Everyone was quite eccentric, uh, like to dress up in their favourite fandoms and show off what they like. Um, and their office is really exciting. Um, I didn't quite find that here, but I am making myself, making my office full of stuff that I like and enjoy and so everyone else can know what I like and hopefully it's easy to make friends. Yeah, I do miss the SMT series in Copenhagen, sorry, in Canberra, because I feel like I don't find that here in Copenhagen yet, but maybe I just have to look a bit harder. This, this, this is an amazing coincidence that there just happened to be a couple of your compatriots or uh, shall I say colleagues in the audience here at uh, Smith's Alternative. Uh, Lieutenant Uhuru. Good evening, Captain Kirk and Davo. Who live long and prosper. Yeah. So what Did brings you to the earth, Uhura? Oh, I mean, I've always been on the earth, but I've always dreamt about the stars. So I guess that's um, what led me into my research. Rajika, uh, now that everybody's here, uh, perhaps you can talk about your special subject, um, binary stars. I think that will be very appropriate at this juncture. Well, not so appropriate when I consider I come from a system with seven stars, algae. So would you call that a septicemic star system? Look, Mr. Spark, just carry on without me for a moment. I just want to talk to Mr. Scotty and check his progress report on our progress. Dr. Rajika, so tell me about uh, binary systems. Uh, do you take a craft out to visit the binary systems? Oh, I wish I could, but unfortunately, at least with our technology on Earth, um, we can't do that. Uh, so what I do instead is I simulate how these stars form. So firstly, I should explain what a binary star is. So we go around one star, but if you have two stars that orbit each other, that's called a binary. And um, then you can have more complex systems like your home system, Spock, which has seven stars. Seven is a lot, but you have like a lot of systems with like three or four stars all going around each other. Um, and pretty much half the stars in the sky are in these multiple star systems. Um, and it's true. I we, can tell you, I have been there. <laughs> and um, we have discovered planets around um, these systems that have multiple stars. And when astronomers have thought about planet formation, we often think about one star because, well, we have one sun, and it's just easy to think about. But, you know, we're seeing these planets around multiple stars, so how did they form? Is it easier or harder to make planets around binary and multiple stars? Because um, there's evidence kind of for and against that, so we don't quite know what the answer to that question is. So in your um, so time, I, there was the Hubble telescope, is that correct, that found uh, the first surprising evidence of so many planets around other stars? I don't know if Hubble found much, but Kepler, the Kepler Space Kepler, Telescope. correct. <laughs> I was just testing you there. There's lots of different techniques to look possible. for stars. Um, and yes, Kepler and a few other telescopes found a, a lot of them. So what Kepler was looking for was these little blinks. So if you have the star and the planet goes around it, if the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks some of the light. And Kepler was looking for these little tiny dips, and we discovered thousands of exoplanets using that um, telescope. And it found some of these planets around multiple stars. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> now we know that planets are around so many of these stars, is that correct? I mean, you've found, what is the number as of this star date here? About 4,000, 5,000-ish. 
And from Kepler looking at only a small portion of the sky, we can then say there must be many, many more. Yeah. Um, so the thing about Kepler is the planets have to be like going in front of the star from our point of view. But there's probably, you know, millions of systems where the planets are, they're going around the star. They're just not blocking the light from our point of view. And we have other techniques to try and find them. So definitely so many planets out there. It's true. I have been to them all. And uh, if I just may say something, Mr. Spock, I think you're doing an excellent job. And Thank you, Captain. Doctor, I think your explanations are just, just wild. We may talk later, Doctor. Could be arranged. <laughs> um, so, yes, my research, because we can't go out into space and look at how these plants and stuff form, I run simulations um, where I have a box in some computer um, and I put in physics uh, like magnetic fields and gas and other things and I look at how stars form and how they interact I look at the stuff around them because that's the stuff that will make planets so I try to see how long it can survive or whether it's destroyed quickly. Perhaps we and could have a look at one of your uh, simulations from your uh, as they call them in these days supercomputer. Yeah so this is um, it's a simulation Pretty bit slow in the middle, but you can kind of see um, where you have bright colors. That's where the gas is. And there are these little um, crosses, which are where the stars are. And this is just looking at how the gas evolves. There's also blue lines, which are the magnetic fields. And you kind of see that as the systems kind of come into view, each, uh, each star has like its own little disk around it. And when they start interacting, um, the disks build up. And, um, and you get these gigantic outflows, as you saw. Uh, there's jets in space. Magnetic fields make these big jets. That's crazy, but they're very important. But what, what we're trying to see is that as these um, stars are kind of going around each other, they have their own disks and plants can form around those stars. So um, those are pretty easy to think about. It's kind of just like a single star, but you just have another star hanging out far away. So it'd be like if we had our solar system, there was another star hanging out beyond Pluto. Um, so that's one system. Um, but there's other systems where we can get um, what we call circumbinary planets. That's where you have the planet go around both the stars and the binary. So if you have two stars going like They're popular in, in, in uh, the popular culture of today is these images of uh, binary stars in the sky of a planet, uh, such as yeah. a, a strange story called Star... Star Wars? I'd just like to interrupt here. I just really like the way you express yourself. I like the way you say hanging out together, the way the planets hang out together, and hanging out in space is a great idea. I think I have plans with Spock. Now, have you had the chance to observe them through one of your Earth-bound telescopes? I believe you went to a uh, quite famous telescope. Yeah, I went to Keck. I didn't get to find these planets actually. Um, I was trying to look for planets around uh, some young stars, but uh, the observations didn't get very far. But it was still very exciting to be observing on Keck because um, that's one of the best observing sites on the world. Um, it's, yeah, 4,000 meters high, so it's, there's very little atmosphere between you and space. So that's, that's one thing that we look for when we're trying to find places to put telescopes. Where exactly uh, is this uh, very high mountain that you're talking about? Oh, yeah, it's Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And it's an active volcano, I believe. I think it's Mauna Loa. I, don't th I, think, I think Mauna Kea is safe, but Mauna Loa was erupting for a long time last year. And that's lower than the telescope, is that correct? So you were safe? It's not um, putting yeah. clouds above the telescope, which would be a disaster. Yeah, so the clouds hang quite low. This, this is how tall the mountain is. The mountain is so high that it's like above all the clouds, which is uh, really handy for astronomy because you need to see space and clouds can get in the way sometimes. So that's why you try to find places where there's very little cloud coverage. So does that mean that every time there's a, a, a high place on your planet, there's a, a telescope on top of it? There's a few other criteria, but generally, yeah, there's like a lot of other high places where we have telescopes, like in Chile and in um, the Canary Islands. Um, so generally, 
high places are a good places to put optical telescopes. Radio yeah. telescopes are a bit different. And have you been to these chilly places? Uh, I did went to Chile on a holiday, and I did point out as many telescopes as I could in the plane. I was quite excited. <laughs> now, I, I, I just do want to ask another question. Uh, I think it's great that you you study all this 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 space stuff because space is very important to to people like me. How important is it your work? What's the point of what you do on your lowly planet? Um, well. I guess I always was inspired by science fiction, which did imagine a bunch of these worlds, some of them that had multiple stars. So it was, um, it, it was yeah, exciting and imaginative. Um, and when we think about, you know, trying to look for life around other stars, uh, we can't ignore planets around binary stars because, uh, well, we don't know how many there are, but we know that there are a lot of binaries and we know that plants can form around them. So this understanding what, like how frequently plants can form around binaries and multiple stars is pretty important to understand, you know, what the likelihood of life is because we can't just ignore a whole population of planets. We have to know how many of them there are and what like kind of climates they can have. So is it just uh, binary star systems that form commonly? Can you go to seven stars with planets around them? Do your um, models yeah. show these kind of things happening? This may have implication for my very existence, you understand. Yes. So um, a lot of stars are born kind of in families. Um, and within that, there might be smaller clumps. And you can have lots of stars, up to seven. Um, but there's also some wild dynamics that are happening. Well, perhaps uh, and we should look at a video of that, of that from your uh, modeling. Yeah. So which one is this? One, six, 184. 184, yes. So in this one, there is a massive star that formed and then a triple star system that formed up the top. And that triple system is quite steady. That could last for a while. But then this big star kind of uh, wanders a bit too close, as you'll see. And it totally uh, disrupts the system. Um, and you have these wild interactions that happen and did some of the stars get tossed out? There you go. Some of the stars got tossed out. Um, and that, that we think that happens quite frequently in space and that can be detrimental to planet formation because those stars that were kicked out probably had disks, but they were just stripped off as they were kicked out of their systems. And also having this big star come in probably also ate up a lot of the disks and the gas and that can probably, well, that took away stuff that could have formed planets. Um, and yeah, there's a few other interactions happening in this movie as well. But yet yeah, often we think that star formation is in these wild environments where you just have lots of stars going around each other and interacting. And that can make it a bit hard to make planets. So um, yeah, this, this is some of the evidence against making planets in binaries. But we also see a bunch of disks and plants in binaries. So, we still have to figure out what exactly is happening. <laughs> it's a complicated system. Oh my goodness, um, Spock has disappeared. Uh, maybe his seven star system can't work. Uh, maybe he's slipped into a parallel universe where it can. Uh, Kirk, you don't look very worried. No, don't worry. I know what to do. Rujeka, <laughs> have, have you ever travelled to an alternative universe? Oh, no, sadly I haven't. You haven't, but you've travelled a lot, haven't you? I mean, all the scientists we've spoken to have either travelled a lot or we're anticipating travelling a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about your travels? Yeah, so um, science is inherently in, uh, an international um, career. You have to collaborate with folks all around the world. So, um, yeah, I've gone to facilities like the telescopes in other countries, and we often have conferences where we look at the big questions. Um, and sometimes there's some pretty exciting things that happen at them. Like I was at a, a conference um, discussing habitability around planets. And it was um, just when uh, the New Horizons telescope arrived at Pluto. So everyone at the conference kind of just dropped everything and made a whole session just so we could like watch the press release of the new like um, pictures from Pluto coming through and then we were discussing what it could mean for possible like life in very cold planets and 
um, planet formation. So that was also exciting. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. Um, so, so if we have any uh, budding scientists out there, uh, a science career is a little bit more than aim, method, equipment, materials, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, a bit more than that. Um, also, it's very hard to do it on your own, actually. Mm. Um, you often need a team of people because you need different well, um, You need more experienced people that can kind of see where experiments kind of might fall through. But also you need younger minds that are also, um, you know, more creative. And you have to have people that, you know, know how the simulations work. But then you also need people that know how the observations work because you have to kind of compare both of them to try to figure out, you know, what other, um, how to reproduce observations with simulations, but also how to interpret, this, um, interpret the, the observations to, you know, construct your simulations. You can't have one without the other. So there's a lot of uh, communication from all sides to really understand um, the problems that we're trying to solve. So a little bit like uh, Meru was saying earlier, it, it's... Um... The, the collaborative um, nature of science is something we really need to hold on to if, if we're going to you know, keep on advancing. Oh, definitely. And it makes you feel really good when you see what you can achieve by, you know, collaborating and working together. Like we made the Kepler telescope and we've made other giant scientific discoveries. And I'm sure Maru and Emily have other um, moments where you could, you just felt really good about collaborating and everyone coming together for a shared goal. Yeah, do you have any moments like that, um, Meru? All the time. I think working as a scientist, working in a team is one of the most rewarding um, feelings ever. Yeah. And yeah. Now, did you have any questions for um, Rajika? Do you name your stars? Uh, um, no. I have discovered a couple of circumbinary discs, but then... Their name is just a catalogue name, which is pretty boring. There's too many stars to give individual names to. Okay. And, um, and, and Emily, uh, your uh, work must also be very collaborative in nature. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we can't do anything without each other. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's a myth, isn't very it? big group. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, mean, I don't know how people, if and how anyone has done things on their own. Uh, and it's also part of the fun. I mean, a huge part of the fun. And uh, yeah. yeah, but it's uh, it's uh, it's important to have uh, other views. I mean, it, it's where multi, like I don't know, multicultural and multi backgrounds are so incredibly important. Because mm. if you just have one background, you fail to see or understand possible problems or understand data. Or so it's it's actually where it's. It should be a very level playing field because everyone's input can be the input that is necessary to understand what we're looking at. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so maybe globalisation um, has some advantages. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. In science, yeah. it's necessary. Yeah, I would say. yeah. Did, did you have any questions for Rajika before we, um, we we finish that segment? Yeah, I'm actually. I'm curious about when you, if you, when and if you decided to be a researcher, or like how, yeah, uh, the moment, or did you always know that you wanted to go into astronomy and, and do this, or was there some defining moment that led you into research? I feel like I'm quite lucky because I always, I kind of yeah, always knew I wanted to do astronomy since uh, since grade three. I had an amazing high, um, primary school teacher in grade three who was teaching us about the solar system. It just blew my mind that there were these other planets, but they're so different to Earth. Like Venus has acidic rain that would like burn you. And Jupiter is this gas giant that has all these moons around it that also had like giant volcanoes or icy oceans. And it was just wild to imagine all these different worlds. And since then, I also learned about other stars and galaxies and I'd always loved astronomy from that moment, and growing up, I was always, always like, I want to be an astronomer, <laughs> and I just sort of kept doing it. Well, thank you very much, Rajika. Can we, can we give um, Rajika a round of applause? It, 